the timing was most auspicious. The public offering was made at the height of the stock market. On October 24, 1929, investors panicked and the market began to crash. By the end of November, the market had lost 40% of its value. The financial strain created a shortage of funds. Factories closed and jobs disappeared. Haverty's strong financial position enabled the company to weather the difficult years ahead. The decade of the Great Depression had begun, and the early 30s were a trying time. Cost control was of utmost importance. With personnel shifts, belt tightening, and modest expansion, Haverty survived. The spirit of cooperation was great. Inspired by the optimism of better days ahead, the Winston-Salem store was opened in 1930, followed by a Jacksonville store in 1931. In 1935, the company celebrated its 50th anniversary, and during a banquet in J.J.'s honor, he was presented with a tribute and a bronze medal cast with his likeness. Four years later, in 1939, J.J. Haverty passed away. He had witnessed some of the most dramatic events in the history of the country. Civil War, Reconstruction, the inventions of the automobile, airplane, and telephone, World War I and the Great Depression. His dream had grown from a single store to an enterprise that encompassed eight states. The decade of the 40s began ominously. By 1941, America was at war, and the nation's young men like Rawson joined the effort. Clarence devoted much of his time during the war years to the National Retail Furniture Association and the American Retail Federation, leading a task force of retailers working with the Federal Reserve Board to develop credit regulations acceptable to the industry and the nation. In 1943, Clarence was president of the National Retail Furniture Association and in January 1945 was awarded the Cavalier Cup the industry's highest award for outstanding leadership. He graciously accepted on behalf of the Haverty's management team. During the war, little improvement was done to the stores, but with the booming post-war economy, Haverty's remodeled and updated its stores. Air conditioning was added as part of the renovations, and in 1946, stores opened in Shreveport, Richmond, and Augusta. By 1946, Ross and Haverty, who had risen to the rank of major during the war, returned to the company, and in May was named corporate secretary. He, along with Frank McGahey and Leonard Gay, worked in the general offices after the war. In future years, they would serve as the principal leaders of the company. But uh, my father started me off traveling because he said, you got to get out and know these people and know what's going on. So. I would go to the markets with a buying group, and met a lot of the factory people, and uh, would travel stores first with my father, then with Russell Bellman, who was vice president, and then I'd go by myself for many, many years. And you learn the business pretty well that way. For more than half a century, multi-story downtown stores were the norm, typically three to six floors. The first floor had a payment window where customers paid their bill. On this level, particular interest was taken to display seasonal items and merchandise of small dollar amounts that might be added to a customer's account. Upper floors were displayed by department. The top floor served as a warehouse and the basement as a clearance center. The return of over 16 million GIs led to a new advancement the suburbs. Created by the demand for affordable housing, home construction took on some of the characteristics of mass manufacturing. A decade of movement of homes to the suburbs had begun, and Haverty stores followed them. As towns grew following the Second World War, uh, you had outlying areas got further and further away from the downtown area, and you had a a shift in the way people lived. In 1955, Clarence, then 73,
took the title of chairman of the board and turned the presidency over to his son, Rawson. 1960 marked the company's 75th anniversary. During the Diamond Jubilee dinner, Clarence was presented with a bronze medal similar to the one given to his father in 1935. There was reason to celebrate as sales for the 42 stores in 10 southern states had grown to more than $22 million. As part of the event, a story of Haverty's and its first 75 years was published, extolling their trademark optimism for what lay ahead. Here is a brief excerpt. The future of the Haverty companies is bright, for the furniture business is an essential and enduring one. It is a pleasant business that involves working with people and with beautiful things, which can contribute toward the happiness of those who possess them. The business prospers when people are interested in making their homes more beautiful, comfortable, and livable. Achieving this harmony between people and their surroundings has whetted the imagination of Haverty staff members through the years. The organization still seeks out young men and women with ambition, with a willingness to work, to study, and to accept responsibilities. It affords a good living, a good career, and a magnificent opportunity to those who seek it. Clarence Haverty passed away in December of 1960. His dedication to business, civic, and religious interests would have a lasting impact. He was chairman of the board of Fulton National Bank. This became Bank South and ultimately part of Bank of America. He was a trustee of the American Retail Federation, the Atlanta Art Association, and the Atlanta Historical Society, as well as a member of the Atlanta City Council. He served as chairman of the advisory board of St. Joseph's Hospital, was instrumental in building the Cathedral of Christ the King, and was appointed by Pope Pius XII as private chamberlain of the Sword and Cape. During the 60s, the concept of the mall was just coming to the south. Haverty's chose retail locations in the shopping areas created by the development of the many new malls. In May of 1984, Rawson Haverty became chairman of the board and Frank S. McGahey became president and chief operating officer. Vice President Jay Slater returned from his duties as general manager of the Atlanta stores to head the merchandise department and Clarence H. Smith, a great-grandson of J.J. Haverty, was elected vice president and regional manager of the Mid-South region and assisted in the merchandise department. Haverty celebrated its centennial year in 1985. A bronze medallion was cast to commemorate the occasion, depicting three generations of leadership, J.J. the founder, Clarence, and Rawson Haverty. The year ended with record sales of over $176 million and record profits of more than $10 million. In 1990, Frank McGahey became chief executive officer. At the October furniture market that same year, J.J. Haverty was made a permanent member of the American Furniture Hall of Fame. Frank McGahey, J.J.'s grandson, delivered the acceptance speech. Jay Slater was named Chief Operating Officer in 1992 and became President and Chief Executive Officer in April of 1994. As the 90s began, Haverty's further distinguished itself from the competition by rolling out an upscale interiors look. A secondary stock offering in 1994 garnered $25 million in additional capital. These funds were used to remodel existing showrooms and open new stores. Rawson, like his grandfather J.J. and father Clarence, devoted himself to charitable causes. My family have all been involved with St. Joseph's Hospital. J.J. Uh, Haverty was very much interested in helping them, and uh, he helped them initially in their first hospital. My father served on the advisory board. The sisters were chairman. They didn't have anybody except advisory board. The sisters ran it for many years. I sat on the advisory board my father and grandfather, primarily my father, raised the funds 
uh, to build the second hospital, the main building. I had not been back from service very long. I'd gotten my discharge money from service. I was going to buy a car. And uh, I had an old car that left over from college days, which was still running, but that was about it. And uh, John Sibley called Hughes and I up and said, uh, we're going to have a fun drive to raise the uh, new building for the hospital. And you and Hughes, Rawson and Hughes, are on my team. And here are your cards to call on. You want to call on five people each. And we want you to ask for big donations. And I have found if you ask for big donations, you do it more seriously if you make a serious donation yourself. So you, Ross, will pledge $5,000, and you, Hughes, will pledge $5,000. Well, there went my new car. <laughs> and I remember that well. I had to wait three or four more years before I got that car. But he was right. I really asked for money. I didn't have any hesitation asking for large funds. <laughs> so he taught me how to raise funds. Rawson was chairman of the board of Bank South Corporation and chairman of MARTA. He was president of the Atlanta Chamber of Commerce and the Atlanta Retail Merchants Association. He was a trustee of the Atlanta Arts Alliance, chairman of the board of trustees of St. Joseph's Hospital and served in numerous other civic posts. In 1983, the Catholic Archdiocese of Atlanta named him Man of the Year. We're serving the principal cities of the South. That's an excellent area. They're all doing well. The company is well organized. It's strong. It's the best in its industry, and it's so recognized. We have excellent people growing up in the business, men and women, who are perfectly capable to keep this thing growing and uh, expanding in the future. In May of 2002, Clarence H. Smith, a great-grandson of J.J., the founder, became president, and in January 2003, chief executive officer of the company. Haverty's has had a rich story. We started out using horse-drawn wagons to deliver on gas-lit streets. We survived the Great Depression and other difficulties as we saw countless competitors fall by the wayside. Without fail, we adjusted to the challenges of the time and grew. The key to the company's longevity is our people. Haverty's could not be where they are today without the dedication and hard work of our associates. It's been a remarkable story, but many chapters are yet unwritten with blank pages waiting for the actions and deeds of individuals and teams yet to make their mark. Present and future Haverty's associates will fill those pages with tales of growth, tradition, service, success. These are exciting times for Haverty's. How big the story becomes will be determined by the desire, ingenuity, and dedication of those picking up the storyline.